that I'm allowed. Uh, um, I want to tell you, um, I, and I hope I'll be able to convey a bit of excitement about an area that we're kind of um, uh, jumping into. Uh, this is something that we started a couple of years ago that uh, to me is coming up very strongly in this field, which is the use of uh, wearable sensing technology to improve, um, I think actually, uh, function for patients when they need to utilize a mobility assisted device or a device that's actually sort of sitting on the body. Uh, examples in these areas are the use of um, uh, tactors that Im Im improve um, afferent traffic in individuals. I'm just going to really go, um, I I'm basically going to skip these slides, but if, for those of you who are interested, this is work that we published on Annals of Neurology a couple of years ago. Um, out of Jim Collins' lab. This is technology that has been used in prosthetics um, a lot, um, and I think uh, some of you at least must be familiar with this type of technology, where people now are looking into expanding the capabilities. I just decided to skip on those slides, so I apologize about it, but I want to keep this on time. Um, where people are now looking into um, taking traditional technology and making it a lot more flexible. And so let me just concentrate on these slides to convey what's happening in prosthetics, whereas in the past, prosthetic was limited to level walking type of ambulation, at least for lower extremity uh, prosthesis, obviously. Um, what people are doing now is to look into providing a lot more flexibility and therefore for instance, you have prostheses now that allow a lower limb amputee, um, above knee amputee, to actually walk step over step, uh, going up a flight of stairs. And this is happening because of the combination of two technologies. One is compact motors, essentially. So actuators are, are becoming uh, very compact and a lot more energy efficient than they used to be. And the other one is actually sensing technology. And in fact, if you look at a commercially available prosthesis by Osur. This is a company that, uh, just for the sake of disclosure, we did some work with in the past. They came on the market a couple of years ago with a power knee, which is a knee that provides torque actuating capability, and therefore patients can actually go up a flight of stairs step over step. But um, this would not be possible if sensing happened to be just on the prosthesis itself. And in fact, even this product has some sensing technology on the contralateral side and through Bluetooth is talking to the prosthesis to figure out essentially whether a patient is approaching the flight of stairs with one foot or the other. This is very much the case now in orthotics. So it looks like this is going to be the next wave. This is work that we did uh, with Huger at MIT. Um, Gil Pratt, who was there a few years ago, came up with the idea of attaching serious elastic actuators to hinge ankle foot orthosis. And this is a video clip that I took at MIT um, in Buher's lab, not in my lab. But it gives you a sense of what you actually get um, in a patient with a very, very simple uh, condition uh, to be addressed that does not require this type of technology but that we show as an example, this is foot drop. Uh, so the person is not capable of controlling dorsiflexion, so the foot is kind of slapping on the ground. And you can see how quickly the system is actually adapting to uh, changes in um, speed of movement. So if we want to take these and move to a stair ambulation, we need actually to build models of these and we need to build uh, controllers that are capable of doing it. And this is what we have been doing with this group at MIT. Um, now the area though, it's very experimental quote unquote. And so what's happening is that um, people are coming to realize that these exoskeleton are very difficult to utilize in patients. And um, the technology is not ready as yet to be utilized to replace traditional orthosis with robotic orthosis. 
But what everybody seems to um, be very excited about right now is actually to take these orthoses and utilize them for uh, retraining motor functions. Um, there is a lot of work in robotics um, that is that aims at retraining motor functions. And this is one of the systems uh, by a company we work with, Ocoma, in, in, uh, in Switzerland, that build this uh, robotic system to actually guide lower extremities during motor retraining. But this system is limited to uh, use in a clinical environment, and it's very expensive. And so clinical centers are not super enthusiastic about it, although um, this is very good technology to retrain um, motor functions in, in some patients at least. We have very, very good results in CP kits. This is a pretty new application of this type of technology. But what's coming up very strongly is the idea of um, embedding robotics in, uh, for instance, knee braces. This is work that we're doing with Dr. Mavroy, this group at Northeastern University, where, for instance, in this case, we modulate um, the damping provided by knee brace, by where in the disc uh, that's, that I'm pointed to with my um, cursor here, we have electrological fluids that are responding to the electrical field um, uh, generated by our controller and changing the viscosity of the fluid by which we um, implement a variable dampers. And as opposed to utilize this knee brace to replace traditional knee braces, we're utilizing this uh, knee brace to guide the knee and retrain motor functions in patients. We're doing the same for upper extremities. This is a project that we're running uh, with Danilo. Um, we have had one of his students in my lab for the past year. This is for upper extremities as opposed to be lower extremities. There is a robotic component that's supporting uh, the arm, but on top of it, we are utilizing sensing technology in combination with robotics. In this specific case, is uh, a data glove, the one that I showed before, which uh, comes from Danilo's lab, where through the sensing technology, we allow patients to manipulate um, objects in the virtual environment. And this, as I mentioned, I think it's going to come up as a very, very strong application where the wearability and the fact that this uh, technology, it's simple to, to be used and done and off, it's going to be very important to facilitate home applications of this technology. This is a system that we still use only in a clinical setting at this point in time, but that we envision through modifications of the robotics, which is too expensive to be moved in the home setting, but rely more heavily on wearable. We envision actually to move um, to the home setting through our Teleria program. So that's what's pretty much it. Let me just conclude quickly um, to summarizing what I've talked about um, this morning. And I hope I convey the excitement for the use of this technology in a rehabilitation setting where I think there has been a lot of emphasis and rightly so on the development of uh, hardware or uh, enabling technology as Andreas would love to say. Um, a bit less uh, so far, but I think it's, it's coming up very strongly. The emphasis has been on manipulating data that we gather utilizing this technology to be able to pursue um, clinical applications. And that's essentially what I have talked to you about this morning. I want to acknowledge before closing all my collaborators, people in my laboratory, on top here, and people in other institutions, and I'd like to take some questions if time allows. Thank you very much. You were talking about using Zigbee, and I just wonder where on earth you put the other end of the Zigbee. Was it in the house, or is it on the body, or what? Yeah, well, it, it, it really varies. 